happy. Uh, so I'm I'm really thank you very much for being there. It's a it's a privilege and uh, it's uh, it's great to um, to have this webinar. And uh, I have to thank particularly Natalie who came to me with the with the idea, and I got very very excited about this webinar. Uh, because uh, this is one of my, my my favorite topics, and I think it's one of the most important topics and one of the most important things we are working on. Anyways, w when when um, Natalie came to me with uh, the idea of this webinar, there were a few ideas that came immediately to to my mind, and obviously the first one is about um, how to put through few few uh, few points that I wanted to share with the with the participants, and also this is going to be. Uh, recorded and this webinar is going to be recorded and we will also make sure that it's available for, for those um, audiences who will be interested in the topic. So the first thing is obviously about science and what I wanted to just is very briefly talk about about the science of early childhood development and, and based on this science and evidence that we have and particularly new evidence and new science around early childhood development uh, linked to a couple of things. One of them is Parenting. Uh, so, can is how can parenting help the development of uh, children and therefore adults? And secondly, how this is going to be um, to be translated into programming? And in particular, there 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 are many areas that we are looking into. Uh, HIV/AIDS is one of them and a very important one. But we are also looking at areas such and, and HIV AIDS has a lot of components and a lot of uh, dimensions, right? Uh, children with HIV AIDS, parents who are at risk of HIV AIDS, parents with HIV AIDS, pregnant women with HIV AIDS, etc., uh, uh, etc. Et and there are other components also like uh, how we are going to create cohesive and, and peaceful communities that are going to uh, change the future of humanity, how we are going to create communities that are going to be more uh, uh, more tolerant, more accepting, more inclusive, and that uh, that obviously speaks about um, uh, people and children with disabilities, uh, or or th uh, or themes like HIV uh, and how we are going to create uh, communities that are going to be more um, uh, inclusive and and and, uh, uh, and friendly to uh, to problems such as HIV AIDS. And the, and the other point that, uh, that came to my mind is obviously scaling up. So I'm going to only talk very, very briefly about an overview of, uh, of what the science and how this is linked to uh, parenting and programming. And then I will leave my, my uh, uh, great colleagues there to talk more about the science uh, of parenting and HIV AIDS and examples of, of, um, of scaling up in Tanzania um, uh, by our colleagues and friends in IRC and our colleagues also from UNICEF in Tanzania. So what the, the big question here is, we know now, do we, we know now how the brain works. We, we know, well, we know a little bit of how the brain works and how it develops. And uh, uh, we know that when children are born, uh, their brain is not complete, the structure of the brain is not completed. I'm sure that many of the participants are very familiar with with some of the data of, uh, and some of the the science behind early childhood development, but just few of them to just yes, as examples to um, to have to have a, to, to to be aware of of how important is early childhood development. When a child is born, the brain structure is not completed, and only from zero to three years old, the around 80% of the structure of the brain is going to be uh, to be uh, built. Uh, that means that when a child is born, as soon as he, as he or she is born, every every second of the life of a baby, uh, the brain builds 1,000 new neuronal connections, 1,000 per second, which means that. Uh, Inside the inside the brain of a baby, there is a whole revolution, uh, and babies are incredible, incredible learning machines. Uh, that happens only when the circumstances around the child are conducive for development, and that's where parenting is uh, is coming into the picture. 
we know since uh, since the since the 60s and some some, th some theories like Volvi or or Michael Rutter that a child to to develop needs to have a special bonding, a special attachment with adults. If that if those attachments are not there, the the rate of development of a child is going to be uh, anything but optimal. So. We are we are mammal, mammals. We are uh, we are we are a species that have evolved during thousands and thousands of years, and the the way we have evolved is because we uh, we collaborate and we interact with each other. So in the in the line of evolution, if we really and this amazing brain that that evolution has created, if it wants to get to an optimal uh, capacity of functioning, we need to have, since the very moment we are born, we need to have connections and we need to have nurturing environments that are going to help us to develop those connections within our brain. The very early years of life, the, 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 uh, until we are nine, the uh, many, many, we don't remember many things that happened before we were, we were six, probably. But those years are the most formative years of our lives, and we know that through, we have evidence that that's the case. If, if you think about yourselves and you, say, and you think, when were the years when I learned the most in my life, probably you are not going to think that uh, those were when you were one or two or three, but actually those were the years where you learned how to speak, you learn your language, you learn how to interact with others, you learn empathy, you learn how to walk, you learn how to, to, uh, to, to jump, to play, uh, to love. So we have the, all this science behind. Uh, we know that uh, the plasticity of the brain is, uh, is incredible in the first years of life, and, and it will never be as our uh, the plasticity of the brain, the, our capacity to learn will never be the same. Uh, and we all, obviously we can we learn all our life and through all our life, but we don't learn as much as we learn in the first years of life if we have these good uh, good relations with adults uh, in, in the environment or the, in the close environment of the child. So how do we translate these science, what we know now about the development of the brain, this incredible machine, into programming. How do we program to uh, to ensure that the development of the brain is or development of the child is is optimal or is uh, the child can achieve the full of the, of of her or his potential? That we usually we say. So we know that if we a child is exposed to vi violence during those years, there is going to be incredible damages for the brain. Uh, it's, it means that there are going to be uh, long life consequences from the physical structure to the behavioral structure and health also. Uh, we know now by science that uh, the children who have been abused or neglected when, uh, or adults that were abused and neglected when they were children uh, have um, a health that has been really very much damaged and affected and is linked to, so abuse and neglect, child abuse and neglect is linked to things like uh, obviously psychological problems, uh, suicide tendencies, uh, but also other surprising, surprising uh, data, like it is linked to uh, fragile bone structure, uh, cancer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we, what we understand is that we need to have a framework, uh, a series of interventions that are comprehensive and that include uh, many sectors around the child to ensure that uh, that this development is going to be optimal. So th basically, early childhood development touches all of us: uh, health professionals, HIV/AIDS professionals, nutrition, uh, child protection, edu education, social inclusion, communications, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Through programs and through environments that are nurturing around the kid. Uh, we are going to be able to create a different kind of society, a society in which the children can develop to their full potential and they are going to uh, be members of communities that are more inclusive and they are more peaceful. That's what we call the ecology of peace. I'm going to, to say, uh, to mention a little, uh, a little, some few words about the systematic review of parenting programs 
uh, that has been done recently and it's going to be it has been completed and it's going to be launched this year <clears throat> which uh, uh, has studied um, 105 parenting programs in low and income median countries I mentioned this because I want to uh, basically answer the question of can parenting help uh, the development of the child can parenting help future peaceful communities and through this uh, systematic review the answer is basically yes it can parenting programming can help uh, improve the development of children I wanted to just mention a few things uh, the, this this systematic review of 105 programs uh, which started uh, which is probably the most comprehensive and intense review of parenting program that has been done in low and income middle countries uh, was done through first uh, they screen more than 8,000 uh, documents of program of different programs and uh, to end up with 105 parenting programs and they look at the different outcomes of these uh, of these programs and basically they look at things like child well-being health nutrition hygiene cognitive development outcomes socio-emotional and holistic uh, holistic uh, child outcomes they look at parenting practices um, particularly the importance of uh, some of them were looking at uh, the parent, parent, uh, paternal involvement uh, and how this links also to child outcomes and they looked also at uh, child safety and child protection and discipline and uh, uh, harsh discipline and, and uh, physical punishment what I will say is that uh, in, 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 the, in the systematic review, what uh, we have seen is that uh, basically there is a clear connection between parenting programs and outcomes for children. And uh, um, I'm not going to go too much into detail of that because I have only a few minutes for, for my presentation. And, and actually, we could talk about this for instead of 10 minutes, we could talk about it for 10 hours. But uh, if um, if the participants are also interested, I will be very happy to, to share more the details of the, of the systematic review. What the systematic review um, basically is, uh, has uh, helped us to, to answer that question. Yes, parenting programs help the development of children. Thank you very much. I leave, uh, I leave now the, word, the floor for Natalie to introduce the next uh, presenter. Thanks and have a great day. Thank you, Eduardo. You really fit a lot into a small amount of time. Tamson, I'm loading your presentation now. Okay, Tamson, go ahead. Thanks. Good afternoon, and I think good morning to some of you, and thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, I just have 10 minutes um, and wanted to focus on um, very briefly a life course perspective to parenting and how it might help us think about the intersect between child development and HIV and parenting. And then I was just going to touch briefly in the time we have on two scientific updates on um, recent publications that I think are important successes in the field and to open a discussion just about middle childhood, the foundation years and some new challenges and sort of frontiers um, moments I think that we have in science. So that idea of life course parenting, I think everyone's familiar with the idea that the child develops over the life course um, and that we know that there are early gains that have later benefits. Um, and this has been a key driver of investments in early child development. So investing early, knowing that this has a cumulative benefit and that we see um, massive benefits later in life. This is also the same in the field of HIV. So early investments in HIV in the pregnancy and postnatal period have massive benefits in terms of reducing or eliminating transmission. And so the absence of the disease then also has significant benefits later for children. We've learned um, through science um, 
Natalie, I'm just not sure how to make the slide continue to transition. I'm not sure if you can do it. Yep, it's um down at the bottom. Do you see slide one of ten and their little arrows? Okay, that does it. Thanks so much. Um, and so we know that there's some really basic services that need to be provided. Um, usually we try for them to be provided within institutions like healthcare services um, and, of course, using community networks also. In the earliest phases of life, healthcare access is critical. And as the child grows into those toddler and sort of middle childhood year, years, issues of safety, safe environments, play stimulation, and access to schooling become really important. I think the the systematic review and also um, evidence over the last two decades has really shown us that it's very difficult for families and parents and children to access those benefits in low and middle-income country settings without economic strengthening. But I think the other really key thing that I'm going to focus on today is how much parents and families really enable children to get the most from the services that we offer through community movements, through governments and through institutions. Um, and so just to really bang on a little bit about that it is love and care and belonging that grows children a lot more than the services in and of themselves. Tamsin, so with that background, Tamsin sorry to interrupt. Um, what slide are you on right now? I'm on slide four. Okay. Can you, at the top of your screen, press the takeover as presenter? Um, yes. Yeah, there you go. Oh, sorry, so have people not been seeing that? <sighs> Natalie, can everyone see that? Yeah, the animation is going now. Okay. So that was the animation when I was making my point about the life course, the key services, economic strengthening, and the very important role that families play. So a recent scientific publication um, followed up on the PEDS trial. It was an intervention trial undertaken in Pakistan. Um, it was delivered in a really sustainable, scalable model using lady healthcare workers, and it delivered the Care for Development Program, which is the UNICEF program, um, adapted for the trial. And in the paper published in The Lancet two years ago, we saw that it significantly improved children's cognitive development outcomes, um, but very importantly, also significantly improved parenting skills, particularly in the responsive stimulation arm, so the arm where there was only responsive stimulation and not additional nutrition. Um, and the study team's gone back to these children at age four and have published now and demonstrated again that the benefits for children hold to age four. But very importantly, we also see in the, in the response stimulation group that the gains that parents gain, so the skills transference to the parents and, and those skills that they got in responsive caregiving, we also see hold at age four. So that's really exciting to begin to demonstrate in, in really adverse settings that using very simple open access packages, we can improve things for children and we can also enhance the caregiver's capacity to care. I think that that's important in terms of the life course because we begin to see the benefits of the investment in the parent increase over time. The second scientific publication I wanted to talk about was something I was involved in publishing about a month ago in Plus Medicine. And this comes much more specifically from the HIV literature. And so we had what we call the vertical transmission study. It was an exclusive breastfeeding support study. It again used the WHO exclusive breastfeeding counseling support strategies. So in all open access, very simple um, interventions. There were four pregnancy visits, a number of visits um, in the home over the first six months to support breastfeeding, and generally a pulling of women closer to health services. We followed up those children aged 7 to 11, and we found that exclusive breastfeeding almost halved the risk of conduct disorders um, in the primary school years. A very important finding because conduct disorders at that age can really undermine a lot of the child's developmental um, and educational capacity. But we also saw that over and above the VTS intervention, that parents who provided stimulation for children at home, and particularly parents who had enabled the child to attend a preschool or crash, had much higher executive function in our study. We saw also that maternal education and executive function play an important role in children's outcomes. 
The most important finding for me as a person who works within HIV and ECD was also that we saw no significant difference between HIV exposed and unexposed children. So what we really demonstrate is by giving children the best start in life, pulling them closer to health services, we can begin to level the playing field for the HIV exposed child, which is a very exciting finding. The one place where we still have quite a lot of gaps is in the foundation years. So with this new developmental age, so when children reach primary school age, they begin to grow up to school, they do become more independent, and they certainly have more capacity to be able to communicate, understand the body, begin to understand disease and illness concepts. And as a result, in the context of HIV epidemic settings, WHO guidelines following a systematic review were to encourage parental disclosure to children. So this is just one example where we've got significant evidence where we know something is helpful. We've got a long history from um, other child other parental illnesses that tell us that children do better when they're communicated to about parental illness um, and that children are able to understand. But we also see very, very low disclosure rates and we see very low health education and sort of parent-led sex education in these environments. So one of the challenges we set ourselves as a team was to say, is there a way to conceptualize disclosure interventions together with parenting interventions, together with HIV interventions in high epidemic communities where children would, um, would, would be very difficult to protect children from, from being aware of HIV, either within the family or within communities. So I just wanted to take a minute as a, as a researcher, often what we try and do in our intervention development is focus on what we think are the key mechanisms um, in, in how we will propose to change something because I think knowing what your mechanisms are help you to make something more scalable if you know what the real key things are. So we proposed that the HIV diagnosis would come as it does in many settings with a fair amount of stigma and a lack of desire to disclose um, broadly and particularly to children. Um, we see in HIV positive mothers particularly um, a concept of what we call avoidant coping, which is where women cope with the HIV infection by avoiding directly dealing with it. And so mothers become very functional, they live with HIV, um, but don't deal with it directly in their families. There's a significant amount of literature that shows that avoidant coping leads to withdrawal and isolation, and that that can lead to lower family functioning. So just less close relationships within the family. And obviously mothers who are more withdrawn, they pull away from their normal support within the family, often experience mental distress, and we propose that that might lead to lower health engagement, and also in turn then impact on mother's health, both her mental health and potentially her physical health. We also know that avoidant coping and mental distress could impact on parenting responses and that those parenting responses then, together with potentially poorer health in the mother, could affect the quality of the parent-child relationship and in turn lead to child development issues, particularly around mental health, and that that in itself can set up a, a cycle which repeats itself and supports itself because the child begins to struggle, act out, parent has lowered capacity to respond to it. And so that's how we try to think about how we might intervene with this. We've come up with a simple model, and I don't have time today to go through all of it. I just wanted to wait to everyone's appetites and invite them to spaces where they could learn more about it. Because I think this is, for me, really a frontier where we have to move towards as children grow older and as we face challenges to child development brought by HIV, brought more and more by um, forced migration, uh, conflict situations, we have to begin to think how we can target a health outcome, but use parenting strategies to implement it. It builds on this idea that, uh, as we saw in the earlier science I presented, the more we're able to transfer skills to parents, the more we can rely on parents to be the magic in children's lives and to sustain that dose while we are away. So Amagugu really is a model that focuses very much on one-on-one -on -one work and group work with parents to strengthen their own capacity within the family, to improve their parenting capacity, and to give them very specific training on the topic or the target of the intervention, which is disclosure to the child. So it really focuses on parents disclosing and then builds on that capacity in encouraging parents to offer health education, HIV education. And what we propose is over the longer term, that increased communication then puts children in a better position um, to be able to have healthier um, outcomes as young adolescents. 
it's a large and long-standing research program, and I just put up some examples because this will be there for people to refer to. We've published most of um, our evaluative work. It's had really, really good results, um, very acceptable and highly feasible, and we've just finished a randomized controlled trial. All of those papers are open access, so anyone interested can just go straight onto the web and, and read up on them or just contact me by email. So I just wanted to finish with a, a closing thought. Um, I'm not sure what's happened now. For some reason, you're on slide three. Uh, I'm, I'll just skip through because I'm not sure what happened there. Mine just went off and came back on. So my concluding thoughts were just really to leave the group with this thought that as we move successfully through one phase, so as we move through the first five years of life and we prevent, in the case of HIV, we prevent vertical transmission or in conflict situations we keep children safe, we get children to access early ECD services, preschool, we successfully transition them, we then have to begin to think about what happens in the next phase. And so in the example of HIV and parenting, we have to think, the second um, half of the child's early child development phase, the foundation years, is a time where parents likely begin to deal more with illnesses, transitions in medication, and so we need to find ways to build on the earlier successes. I also think it's really important for us to begin to recognize that the science shows us one thing unequivocally. Parents add to the dose. So parents give a contribution in all of our interventions, and parents make it last. So I think it's really important if we want to think about sustainable and scalable models that we really focus on skills transference to parents. No, I often say this in my field in HIV, we focus a lot on home visiting to capacitate um, caregiving. And I think home, it's important to remember that home visiting in itself is never going to be sustainable. So we can't continually visit, but what we can do is make sure that during those visits, we transfer skills to parents to make sure that they continue the dose after we're gone. And I certainly think if we begin to explore the foundation years more, parenting could become one of the most important tools in HIV prevention. Um, thank you very much, Tamson. We just had somebody join. I need to mute. Okay. Tamson, was that your conclusion? Yes. Okay, great. That was so wonderful. I feel so lucky that you were able to join us and share all of the, your perspective and the science, the, the latest science. Um, I'm sure people will have questions, and everybody loved your animation. But um, we'll save those questions for the end. And Caitlin, I'm going to load your presentation now. So, Caitlin, if you take over, there you go. Good morning and good afternoon. <laughs> um, thanks, Natalie, um, for having us. Um, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Yep. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, so thanks so much. Um, my name is Caitlin Wilton. Um, I'm very excited to tell you about this project we worked on in Tanzania. Um, I was based there for two and a half years, and I've just moved back to New York to work here at, at IRC's headquarters um, in New York. Uh, so the goal of IRC's uh, parenting program is ensuring children receive nurturing care from consistent caregivers and early, early learning opportunities to support their development and future well-being. Now, in Tanzania, risk factors include poverty, malnutrition, uh, exposure to violence, as well as HIV. Uh, these put children at high risk for not reaching their full development potential, as we've heard from the previous presenters as well. Um, the Violence Against Children survey done in 2009 found that 74% of children surveyed had experienced physical violence in their childhood. Um, okay. uh, 
Uh, so IRC has strong capacity in delivering parenting programs to support caregivers and improve early childhood development, and has demonstrated the impact in, um, of parenting programs in three different randomized control trials conducted in Burundi, Liberia, and Thailand. Um, but in order to address the scale of the problem in Tanzania, we knew that we had to think differently about our program model to influence change at the national scale. So Healing Families, as we call our, our program, uh, took a system strengthening approach. So we worked closely to build the capacity of key uh, public stakeholders. Uh, we targeted uh, two key public institutions. So we know within Tanzania that social workers have direct interaction with families living with adversity. So we identified as a promising strategy to target these institutions that support and build the capacity of, uh, of, of social workers in Tanzania. Uh, we worked with the government's Department of Social Welfare, and this is under the Ministry of Health and Social Welfare. Um, as well as the Institute of Social Work uh, to equip a, an initial cohort of government social workers that would be able to train in evidence-based parenting. Uh, okay. the, so our curriculum um, was based on an extensive literature review of parenting interventions in both high income as well as low and middle income contexts. Um, it builds on the nurturing parenting program as well as the strengthening family parenting program. Um, the key components are the role of nurturing stimulation and play in brain development, uh, uh, empathy, positive communication and discipline with dignity, uh, supportive guidance and routines, as well as parental self-care and psychosocial support. Um, to do this, uh, we use the cascade training model. Um, so firstly, the uh, IRC technical specialist trained a group of 18 um, national trainer of trainers from the ISW and DSW. Um, these trainer of trainers um, then trained um, 59 ISW social work students to become uh, parent group facilitators. Uh, then 33 of those students facilitated parenting groups during fieldwork for their, for their degrees at ISW. And the fieldwork was, um, they, for that, they were attached um, to the social welfare offices in um, Temeke, Dar es Salaam. Um, and 30 uh, social welfare officers supervised the students. Uh, Eduardo, I'll, I'll take these questions at the end, I think. Um, thanks for that. Uh, to guide the project um, as we went along, um, the, a positive parenting task force was formed. Um, they were instrumental in um, reviewing all the materials, translations, um, and even coming up with their own ideas of what was going to be useful to, um, to ISW and students as well as um, social welfare officers. Um, they also became um, instrumental in a lot of internal advocacy um, within their own institutions. Um, this task force was made up of ministry staff um, as well as lectures and senior leadership from the ISW. Um, Uh, throughout the project, um, we created uh, contextualized multimedia tools. Uh, the first is the Parenting Handbook. Uh, this was actually um, conceptualized and written by three lecturers from the ISW. Um, they envisioned it as a tool that, uh, for parents to take home and to remind themselves of the skills. Um, and we, as IRC, we supported um, with getting this illustrated. Um, yep, all the tools are available. Uh, we'll send you the links. Um, and, uh, and next, the videos. 
Um, so the videos are in two parts. Uh, one part focused on parenting skills, um, so directly to the parents themselves. Um, this provides guidance, for example, on parent-child interactions, such as serve and return. So you, so you actually see some nice demonstration of um, mothers and children in Tameke Dar es Salaam uh, practicing this nurturing interaction. Um, as well, there's a, a series on facilitation skills. So this shows um, the ISW facilitators setting up role plays where parents practice the skills um, and, and receive feedback and guidance. Um, now, these tools were just launched in February. Um, we've only done initial dissemination um, to the parents in this particular program um, and to the facilitators that were trained through the program. Um, we are looking to explore more uses for these um, and are happy to share them with, with you. I'll, I'll share these links um, in, in the chat window afterwards. Um, so, and feel free to reach out if you have um, ideas about these, um, these tools. Okay. Now, we reached about 400 parents. We trained about 18 government social workers. But the achievement we're most proud of is the addition of an ECD course to the ISW's curriculum. So we, we imagine that this will help sustain interest and effort um, in capacity building for social workers on ECD and parenting support. Um, so we're really, we're really excited about this. Um, it draws heavily on the uh, Healing Families curriculum that I talked about in the previous slides. Um, and um, yeah, so this is uh, just year one of this initiative. We have a lot of ambitions for strengthening the program, identifying other ways to bring parenting programs to scale, um, and we're exploring those options. Um, and we look forward to um, keeping in touch with you uh, as, as we go along. So I'll end there. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Caitlin. That was great. It's so it's so nice to move from the science into something really practical and see the success that you guys had. Um, and now I'm going to be loading the presentation of Hafsa, who is from UNICEF in Tanzania. And um, Katie, there might be more questions, or Caitlin, there might be more questions later after Hafsa pre presents. Hafsa, there you go. You took over as presenter. Great, thanks. Hafsa, I don't have any audio from you. You hear now? Yep, I can hear you. Okay. So I'm going to share with you some of the experiences and some lessons learned from the implementation of the PMTC community projects where ECD was integrated in those two projects. So I will discuss about the ECD in PMTC project, but I'll also share with you some highlights on the mapping uh, of parenting initiatives, the, uh, the activities that we have supported, but I'll also highlight some next steps with careful child development rollout. So from 2011 up to early 2015, UNICEF, in partnership with AMLEF, implemented some community PMTST projects. We had mother mentor project as well as mother support groups project. And these were only implemented in the uh, UNICEF supported regions. The projects were community based and they really aimed at increasing utilization of facility services by strengthening the linkages between the community and health facilities. So we know we are individuals at community level and the PMTC services are available at health facilities. So we really want to bridge that gap between community and health facilities using these two models. 
So the objective was to improve, as I said, utilization of comprehensive PMTC services by HIV positive pregnant as well as lactating mothers, postnatal clients, and their, HIV, and their children being HIV exposed or HIV infected, but also to reduce loss to fall up among HIV infected women who are enrolled in the PMTC program and their influence. So, who were the target groups for this project? We had uh, HIV infected pregnant mothers and lactating mothers. We have their male partners being positive or discordant couples, but we also had some HIV exposed and infected children. And in the perspective of ECD, we consider these groups to be like the low hanging fruits because. HIV exposed and HIV uh, infected children, they are already there through these groups. So we only need to intervene where we can. So the involvement of the national or regional decision health facility was really important for doing planning as well as implementation of this project just to ensure sustainability. We had to do some training of healthcare workers and mother mentors and mother support group leaders who received like a two uh, weeks training on PMTC nutritional aspect, and when we introduced Option B Plus, they were also updated on that one, as well as some training on ECD. In these projects, male involvement was highly encouraged, but we made sure that the men are not dominating the groups. There were some meetings, at least once, uh, at health facility, and healthcare workers were uh, attending these meetings just to guide some discussion. So they could meet and discuss some issues on adherence, disclosure, exclusive breastfeeding, those uh, sessions. And uh, in terms of monitoring uh, aspect, the project has some targets that were aligned to the national PMTC indicators, meaning that whatever these uh, projects were doing was contributing to the overall PMTC achievement. So we were tracking some uh, indicators like HIV, uh, exposed testing, prophylaxis, as well as treatment for those infected ones. So on Mentor Mothers Project, who are these? These are women who have gone through PMTC uh, cascade, meaning that they were pregnant, they were tested for HIV, and they received their uh, test results, but they also received ART, and their babies got tested. Babies also got some uh, ART uh, prophylaxis, and, but for those who turned to be HIV positive, they were linked for ART long-term treatment. So in total, we trained the almost 44 mental mothers to per facility. And in this particular uh, model, mental mothers, they were spending some hours at health facility, almost like working hours. So we found that this mode was extremely useful during implementation of Option B+, where we need some adequate and quality counseling which could not be uh, provided by healthcare workers regarding issues of uh, human resources. Uh, in that, to compensate for their time, they were given some allowances. So here we can consider some issues of sustainability. So the other model was mother support group. Again, this was community-based uh, model, and these are the women like the mentor mothers who have gone through the PMTST cascade, and they are willing to support the others. So in total, we formed the 69 groups, and these groups had some structured leadership with with chairperson, secretary, treasurer, and in this kind of leadership, we did need making uh, women getting some leadership. So they were given some bicycles, mobile phones, just to support the tracking of lost to follow-up clients. Remember, one of the key objectives was to ensure there is no loss to follow-up, so they were given some tools to support them following their loss to follow-up clients. So at the end of every week, the, loss to follow, the names of loss to follow-up were given to mother support group leaders for them to do the tracing and they could give back the feedback to the healthcare workers. Different from mother mentor, the mother support group was purely voluntary work, but then some incentive like t-shirt, bags, uh, bicycles were given to group leaders, which in a way it was increasing visibility of the projects. So in terms of integration of the ECD within these two projects, 
our aim uh, generally was to ensure that we have healthy baby from healthy pregnancy, which means in the PMTST context is to ensure that we have HIV free babies. So we ensure that they, we provide the uh, quality counseling of HIV infected pregnant mothers, but we also ensure that moms are initiated on treatment, but also they are there to those treatment. There were some issues of dis disclosure and uh, uh, members of the groups, they were sharing experience with the others in terms of how did they safely disclose to their partners. So we ensure that there are some uh, members that receive immunization, also prevention of against malaria, just to ensure that it is a health pregnancy which will live outcome of health baby. Uh, in their groups, we really wanted to ensure that the food security is secured. So there are some nutrition activities going on within the groups, which involve some gardening, uh, chicken keeping. That is their, their own initiative, which in a way kept them uh, group dynamics and keep them moving. They thought of having some saving services. But we also they were uh, cancelled on nutrition, nutrition assessment so that they can do the work for their own babies once they, they are born. The, one of the key components was couple testing for HIV. So men were, were encouraged to come during antenatal clinics. And they also get tested for HIV. And for postnatal, we will ensure the exclusive breastfeeding. As much as this is important to prevent mother-to-child transmission, but it also promotes bonding and, uh, and attachment we have heard from previous uh, uh, presentation. But also we ensure that the routine immunization, like EBCG and the like, and uh, during the visit, uh, at, at, at uh, uh, under five clinic, healthcare workers and mother mentors do provide some uh, 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 skills and uh, some knowledge in terms of uh, air stimulation for, for these mothers. We ensure that all uh, HIV exposed children, they receive the HIV infant diagnosis at six weeks as per the guideline, but it was also an opportunity for them to be uh, told on how to make some uh, toys using the available local materials, but also promoting uh, current positive parenting that we are, we, are, we are already in the community, emphasizing on praise, smile, and the communication. So the project, those two projects ended March 2015, but before the closure, we thought of sustainability. So we asked each CHMT, Council of Health Management team, to form like 10 mother support groups from high volume facilities, which we're adding to the groups that AMREF were already implementing. So we thought this could be somehow a sustainability plan. My presentation is loading. Oh, I have taken back to study three, sorry. It seems like there's a glitch for some reason. Um, Hafsa, what, sorry, what slide were you on? I was on slide 11. Okay, and are you advancing now? Because it's still stuck on yes, three yes, for us. Okay, I'm going to take so over now. as presenter. Okay. Because 11. I, yeah. So at the end of the uh, uh, of the project, we conducted end term evaluation, and this was a very important as one of the components that was missing is evaluation of this uh, kind of project. So we wanted to document some best practice we learned from the project, but also discuss uh, uh, document issue of relevancy and, as well as sustainability. So the official report is not yet out, but I'm going to highlight just some few findings from the evaluation, which we found that mother support groups as well as mother mentor projects provided needed support for clinical teams. As I told you, they were spending some hours with the with their, with their healthcare workers, which provided some quality of PMTC service, which healthcare workers on their own did not provide. But peer models provided both psychosocial support and a platform for implementing ECD for HIV exposed and infected children. But uh, also, we realized that incoming generating activities uh, the saving scheme that they were doing, as well as gardening, they kept the, the groups together, which ensured some sort of sustainability in a way. Hafsa, can you take so, back over as presenter? 
Okay. So I'm on slide 13. Okay. So I'm going to share with you mapping of the parenting initiative, the, the activity that UNICEF supported after we realized that there are a lot of uh, initiative that is happening, but we do not have a stock of what is happening where. So, uh, again, there was no like a clear source of data on family care, and uh, there was no mechanism for coordinating uh, initiative by either sector, modality of delivery, age group, and the like. So, the new planned initiative were likely to start from the zero. So UNICEF took that initiative to do some mapping of the parenting exercise. So the objective for the mapping was to build an uh, evidence based for improving coordination in Tanzania. But mapping uh, was more specifically just to ensure uh, we document the target age group, uh, the issues covered, who is where doing what, what are the entry points for different initiatives, but as well as geographical coverage of those initiatives. So. We, uh, we concluded that 29 initiatives were mapped, and uh, some of the few conclusions from the, from, the, uh, from the mapping, few programs were at scale, and the majority were just like here and there. There was no coordination from national to village level, and few evaluations in Tanzania had some data. No wonder I wanted to do the evaluation because that's one of the big shortcomings. The voice of families was missing from program design, but also lack of coordination and alignment of the contents. Only 12 out of 29 addressed ECD. Again, there was no clarity in terms of key ECD messages, where they were aligned and enforced or contradicting to each other. So, the next step for rollout of care for child development uh, with some support from UNICEF Regional Office, we conducted uh, a regional care for child development in Tanzania where we hosted almost like five more countries and uh, 12 master trainers and 12 uh, participants were trained on basic courses. These were both from Tanzania mainland as well as from Zanzibar. And the uh, involvement of those participants was little to ensure that we have much sector in terms of Ministry of Health being part of it and the Ministry of Education. But the coordination law, we agree, should remain within the Department of RSH because we're talking of zero to three years. And uh, at the end of the course, we develop the short-term plan of action, which we have to follow. So more next step is the formation of technical working group, which is not existing. We have to form this one. This one is going to foresee the care for child development activities. We are going to uh, detail review the experience and uh, just to build on the mapping exercise because the mapping did not take stock of the messages. So we are going to build on that one just to, to, to uh, map out some of the parenting messages that exist. But also we are going to advocate for ECD and incorporate CCD in sector plans. As per now, EMTC strategy is being revised and we are going to develop a new one, the elimination for mother child transmission strategy for Tanzania. So I look at this one as a great opportunity for us to incorporate ECD issues which were not there before. We are going to cascade down the training, starting with the training of zonal and regional TOTs, followed by training of healthcare workers and community healthcare workers. But very important is to ensure that we do sensitization of PMTST and HIV managers, because if you don't sensitize them, it becomes difficult for them to, uh, to buy it because they don't understand the issues. So I'll finish with this take home message that families and communities that are living with HIV, they undergo a terrible pressure to cope with the impact of HIV. Hence, they need some uh, specific support, psychological support, uh, so that they can help their children to develop to their full potentials. And I look at this kind of uh, PMTC uh, community projects like Mother Mental and Mother Support Group to provide a perfect platform for implementing such interventions like ECD. That's the end, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Hafsa. There are a lot of comments in the um, conversation window saying how helpful this was to hear specifically about 
ECD programming within HIV. Um, it's 9.30, so we were planning on ending at 9.30, but we have a few questions if people can hang on. Tamson, uh, Eduardo wrote early on, it would be interesting to hear more about your ideas for scaling up in the combination of home visits and group intervention, as well as the impact of messages and public campaigns. Um, do you Do you have a response to that? I'll just respond briefly because I think that there's quite a lot of other things to discuss. I think what is key, if I use the South African example, I think as governments start to invest in ECD, it's um, it's certainly easier to conceptualize how you take support to center-driven um, sort of sites or to institutions. So it's easier to imagine adding another year of preschool, ECD centers, um, group and play groups. I think where people really struggle um, with is how, what to take to the home and at what dose um, and at what cost. So for me, it's then it's the same conversation because the, the way you reach scalability, I think, is to take something to the home um, through your home visit where there's skills transference. And I think all of the successful models have had a component of home visiting to that. We haven't yet seen one that was able to do it away from the home. So I think particularly in communities where it's more rural, it's harder to get to a centralized site, um, certainly the home visiting doesn't have to be through an institutional capacity. It can be through community members, mentor mothers. But I think the focus on scaling has to be around skills transference. Um, and to to think about scaffolding skills for parents in the same way as we scaffold them for for children, so that that is a capacity that gets built on over time um, and and begins to disseminate within the family to children born later, so that it becomes less and less dependent on a program visiting or a home visit. So that's the only comment I would make. Great, thank you, Tamson. And just kind of moving through the comments section, uh, Marie Vittoria said, I'm interested in how we measure impact of parenting support by social workers in the case of Tanzania and whether additional institutional arrangements were needed since the inclusion of the ECD module in the training curricula, um, say increased salary, new training, and supervisors. Uh, Caitlin, do you have a response to that? Let me unmute you. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Um, yeah. Thanks, Sally. Um, yeah, so um, that's something that remains to be seen a bit um, in terms of the second half, to, half of your question. Um, the, the ISW does want more support in training the, the rest of their lecturers to, to um, enable them to, to train um, and roll out this new curriculum, the new course on ECD. Um, so that's something that um, we're looking at for the next um, the next round of funding um, should it come through. Um, as well in terms of measuring the impact on children of this, of the um, Healing Families uh, curriculum and, and model, um, we've, we've done some just very initial um, testing using um, the MIC tool, um, and we've seen increases in um, in parents playing with their children and decreases in um, in um, acceptability of the use of harsh discipline. Um, but I can share a bit more about that um, if, if folks want to email me. Thank you. Great. And um, Hafsa, we have a question from Pia saying, given the conclusions, what plans are in place to involve families and communities in the next steps beyond engagement with government, even at decentralized levels? Do you have, um, do you have any response, Hafsa? I think you're on mute. We have there we realized that in many of the projects, our community is somehow left behind, and from the from the uh, from the planning, we agree that we do need to do sensitization of the managers, but we also have to uh, to involve the village and the community leaders as a part of sensitization. So it was not mentioned in my presentation, but in our action plan, we also plan to have some sensitization meetings for the community uh, uh, leaders as well as families at the at like very, very low levels. And uh, there was the, uh, 
uh, question or concern regarding whether we can use the CCD materials with social welfare, but also uh, use the with the Minister of Health use healing families curriculum. So far, Minister of Health is uh, has three departments: social welfare, community development, as well as RSH, and they were all part of the CCD training. And as a country, we agree we are going to move forward with CCD training. Of course, adapting it uh, to, to the context of Tanzania, but um, I can't comment regarding uh, the use of the healing families curriculum for healthcare workers so far. Great, thank you. Eduardo, do you have any final final comments or sort of summary? I, I saw you were really um, making the connections between CCD and ECD and then maybe even the connections between the two Tanzania programs. Well, well like what I can say is the, the three presentations have been incredibly inspirational and I think it's very interesting to see Tanzania just as one example and I'm sure there are many we could uh, probably need to explore through more webinars on how this is happening in other countries, how there are different entry points and uh, to improve the development of children through different departments in the government and how UN agencies and NGOs are working uh, and coordinating to, to make this happen. It is uh, It was really inspirational, both of the presentations in Tasmania as well as the as uh, as uh, Thompson, your presentation, and uh, what it is is a lot of a lot of food for thought, and a lot of um, a lot of information to do more quality programming and to look at scale up and uh, scale up and sustainability. I, I just have to thank the other presenters, and I think this is just one step. I don't think that this webinar is more like opening doors. For, for further conversations and further work together. Thanks. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for that summary. And so in conclusion, I, I posted a link uh, to our Yammer group that we can post all of these resources there with the permission of the presenters. Um, so please join that. And if you have trouble, just email me. Um, Caitlin posted the, the materials, um, the resources in the conversation link. So that's great. She also shared her email. And so we, yeah, we hope this is the first of many webinars that bring together ECD, people who work in ECD and HIV and um, just share the ideas. So thank you very much for joining. And we'll also... Yeah, one, one more thing, Natalie. I especially yeah. have to thank Natalie. And I think we all, the participants, and probably the ones who are going to listen to the re uh, recording of this webinar, thanks to you, Natalie, for organizing this and being so uh, great and so generous with your time and with your energy to make this happen. Thank you, Natalie. No problem. We'll, we'll post this recording so that so that other people can have access to the information. Thank you very much.